I want to introduce my colleague, Ram Rajagopal, who is a faculty in civil and environmental and electrical engineering. Right? Yes. Uh, any other right. departments did I miss? Um, so far, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, but before we start, I just want to just quick, um, we had a, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Secretary Schultz yesterday. Wasn't that amazing? And, you know, he has so much of just wealth of experience that he could share. Uh, I thought it was, it, it's always the hit. Um, and I, I just got back from San Francisco, I just drove back. There's a big, as you know, Global Climate and Action Summit going on that Governor Brown um, is holding. And he just signed something called SB100. Has anyone heard of SB100? It's the, it's a very coded language but it is the state Senate bill to go to 100% carbon-free energy in California by 2045, okay? And this is now the law of the land and uh, amazing. Of course, we don't exactly know how to get there, um, <laughs> and, and which is why this topic is so important out here. Actually, let, let me correct myself. It's 100% carbon-free electricity, not energy, carbon-free electricity uh, for this. And I just, uh, that's going on. I was at a gathering. Uh, how many of you have heard the Giving Pledge? Okay, Giving Pledge is a group of billionaires uh, and hundreds of multimillionaires who have decided to give away uh, half their wealth for philanthropy, started by Bill Gates and others. And they had a gathering out here to convince them if there's any issue that is important, it is the energy climate nexus that is probably the most important because it affects you know, food, affects migration, it affects everything that we can think of. So, um, so this is going on in parallel. And I told them, sorry, as, as important that is, I got to come here because I got some students waiting out here. And so here we are in the, with a the backdrop of 100% carbon-free electricity We'll talk about the grid, and I'm going to ask uh, Ram to give a sort of introduction of what's going on in the electricity world. What are we doing out here, Ram? Yeah, so amazing to, to hear the changes that are happening right now. It's a big opportunity. I think um, what we are seeing in the grid is a transformation where we are adopting more renewables, which causes intermittency and uncertainty into the usual operations of the grid. And that starts to require us to have new strategies. So the traditional paradigm of the grid has been generation follow load. And that means whenever there's a variability in generation, there has to be other generation to compensate. If you wanna do 100% renewables or carbon free in that manner, you would have to have enough backup power to absorb any variability of that. Um, I think the first challenge that we're facing is regarding how to use the, all the other resources in the grid, from transmission level storage to the ability to control the transmission system, all the way down to the distribution network, customers, and um, all other assets in order to balance the system better. And I think that also opens up questions around markets, policies, business models, and various other things. Inspired by this, uh, Arun and uh, a group of faculty here have established a program called Bits and Watts, which is to address this question of how to reduce the cost of operating this system overall when we are starting to absorb more renewables and storage and technology. That's right. I mean, the goal is to decarbonize the grid, because if you don't, um, we won't be decarbonized at all, because the transportation is moving to the electricity as well. So we are seeing some massive changes going on, and I think in the next 20 to 30 years, we are going to see a very different energy system. Uh, there are countries that are announcing that they're going kind of all EV and, or no gasoline car sales after 2030, 2045, you take the number um, and, you know, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. So as a result, and they're all relying on the grid. And the grid, as, as uh, Ram pointed out, is going to have volatility at both ends. 
on one end is the solar and wind integration because they're just the cheapest, okay? Um, and this is purely economics, and I call it this way, economic will always trump politics, okay? And um, economically, that's the most affordable thing to do. On the other hand, you have variability on the edge of the grid, whether it is EVs, big loads, EVs are going to be big loads. We will have networked thermostats that's right. uh, that we can somehow, someone can remotely, you can sit out here, open up an app, you can change your load, and if someone does it for you, and if the 100,000 homes go up one degree Celsius in the set point, and thereby the load goes down suddenly, it can destabilize the distribution network. So suddenly you find volatility at both ends of the grid. That's correct. And you know how to manage that is a non-trivial That's correct. aspect. And That's right, very important. And Arun, maybe it's worth if you share a little bit of your experience of how these changes are happening, not just in the United States. That's right. Yeah, this is happening worldwide. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it is a problem, not just the U.S. grid, um, but Europe and India and China. And it's even faster there. It's faster there. That's right. And the uh, infrastructure is different, and and we need solutions that can be customized, tailor made in all these different places around the world. Yeah. So it's an enormous challenge. And we are still living in the architecture, architecture, of the Tesla Edison grid. That's where we are, and it was never designed for all of these variabilities. That's right. So why is the name of our initiative bits and watts? Because in Tesla and Edison's time, the only mechanism of communicating between load and generation was frequency. That was the only. So, you know, if you have, if the load goes up, the frequency goes down. And so someone turns on the generator up so that the frequency comes back to 60 hertz in the United States, 50 hertz in other parts of the world. That's how the communication happened. That's how the grid is run today after 120 years. It's still run the same way. And so we are saying that, well, maybe we could do better. Not to say that we'll throw away the old system, but the idea of bits is data. We all hear, I'm sure you've heard about something called IoT, right? Internet of Things. Well, um, in this case, we will have IoT, but these IoTs will have to satisfy the laws of physics, where your Fitbit does not have to satisfy the laws of physics, at least the electricity physics. So... This is the challenge that we have. How do you take data from number of sources around the grid, whether it's transmission system, substation, your home, everything else, and how do you coordinate in a way that can rewire the grid in a virtual way and still manage the volatility at both ends? And this is a, not just a technical problem. It is a markets. It's a pricing issue. It's yeah. a business model. Someone has to make money. Otherwise, it won't last. Because the whole design of the whole thing was made assuming the grid as today is what's operating. And all the other elements was, were designed on top of it. If you change that, now we have to rethink everything. And um, I think it's a, it's a very exciting time. Very exciting. As if you're an engineer and you're passionate about this, it's super time. And the corporations in Bits and Watts from all over the world. Yeah. And they want to come and join. The more want to come and join. And I hope you guys join as well if you're interested in this topic. But maybe you could give a few examples of projects that are going on, the educations. Yeah. I, so first of all, the first principle we had in Bits and Watts was to, give, to have a comprehensive education. So we have classes ranging from classes in the business school to classes in the School of Engineering and so on. So my course, as an example, is a course that is called Modern Power Engineering. And it, it is not your traditional plain vanilla power systems class. Because what we learned with you guys from the feedback of students, from the feedback of industry, from the feedback of faculty, is we need students who are prepared to piece the systems together and have a holistic understanding of how the grid works, how to model this whole thing, and be able to simulate things in the computer, work with data, and so on. Not just your traditional power calculations and wire sizing, transformer sizing. I think those people are very well aware of how to do. And we are now going into this new world where, as an engineer in this place, you need to know mechanics.
mechanical engineering. No, electrical engineering. You need to know economics. You need to know civil infrastructure engineering. You need to know, of course, energy systems engineering. And you need to have this idea of how these things piece with each other. And if I change this, how it affects the rest. You, you can't really change one thing and by yourself solve the problem. I think that, that's the big challenge and why it is also um, an exciting challenge. If you are in the side of learning, you can learn so many things. That's on the education side. On the research side, we started. The first concept we had was to bring machine learning and AI to grid research. Um, we, we, for those who took the master class, you saw some examples of that. Arun also gave an example uh, of deep solar, of how you can apply AI. Uh, maybe Arun, you can give some examples of what you did at Google as well. As a... Sure. So when I was at Google, um, you know, we um, asked the question that, okay, so Google, if you go to the data center, it's, uh, it uses megawatts of power. And there's some amazing technology internally within Google uh, on managing electrical power. Uh, it's a grid in itself, and in fact, high voltage grid uh, inside the data center because it reduces losses then, and it's cheaper, and um, and it enables computing. And we asked the question: Okay, can we flip that around, and can we have computing, uh, the most modern network distributed computing, um, enable the grid? So flip that around. And uh, especially with a view that if you're looking at those two, one and a half to two billion people who do not have access to the Tesla Edison grid, um, you still want to string them along and do you want to leapfrog them from the 19th century to the 20th century or 19th century to the 21st century? And that's the question we asked. And we had a whole program within Google called the Bug Project, the bottom up grid. Instead of bringing top down, now that solar and, and storage and all is so cheap, can we develop microgrid solutions? And can we do it in such a way that a 10 year old kid can put the grid together like an extension cord, which is how it happens in many parts of the world where there is no grid? It's like they keep, you know, in you know, a daisy chaining. Um, and wires and soon enough, but you got to make it safe. You got to make it automated. You know, there is no, there's no half automation. It's, there's like, there's no half pregnancy. You know, there is no half automation. Either you go no automation and you hand do it or you do full automation and you make it so smart and, uh, and to make it run in an automated way, in an intelligent way. And people talk about smart grid, but frankly, today, the smart grid concept is not that smart. We only have meters. The meters are producing data. Uh, we don't do much with the data. No. And we don't use it enough for the control of the grid, which is what a true smart grid ought to be. And that's what Bits and Watts is all about. That was the Google project. And some of the concepts and ideas have come out here uh, in the Bits and Watts project as well. That, that's where we started. Um, I, I think it's also a way of starting to see how to use this information technology tools like AI, like machine learning, like networking for some societal good. And energy is an area that can have an enormous impact. You have sure. been seeing this this whole week. Uh, this was one of the reasons why I myself, you know, I come from Brazil, Arun comes from India. I know in these two countries, lights flicker. Um, I thought it doesn't happen here, but I wasn't. Sometimes there are no lights. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But even here in Stanford, I found out some colleagues who live a little further back, uh, yeah. the lights flicker a little bit. So, uh, you know, for me, this was an exciting topic, but it always seemed, why would the kind of tools and solutions that I love, would they apply to this? And I think it's a resounding yes. So that was an inspiration. That's where we started. And I think the vision is to go well beyond that. It is to start to build the systems view into a technology, into kind of a platform for the grid. And being at Stanford, you're not a company. You don't have to necessarily find an immediate profit motive or you're not going to have all the participants of the grid as your antagonists. 
I think that is the other right. enormous advantage you have here. You can be in a sandbox. That's yeah. right. And so maybe before we open it up for question, let me just say one thing that we are now thinking of launching, and we'd like to see if there are people interested in this. The challenge of EV charging is a new challenge. There is no history to look back and look at past data to see how to design and operate EV challenge, right? EV charging is, is, is variable in time and space. Renewable generation is variable in time. We know the where the space is. In between, there's a grid. Sometimes there'll be congestion on the grid. We won't be able to charge EV. And when you have electric vehicles that have penetration of only a few percent, that's an easy problem to solve. If you're at 30, 40, 50 percent penetration of EVs and you don't have the charge, it's like you know, your phone is dying out and you, you're looking for the outlet. And, and that's not a good place to be. And we may run into that situation. So one of the things that we are looking at right now is a project that we're designing along with the, uh, the corporations, the private sector. And they need help because this is an intersectorial issue. You've got electricity on one side, you've got automobiles, you got service companies like Uber and Lyft and others, and other in you know, other countries there's DD, there's Ola Taxis, other right. They all service mobility service providers. We're coming from the service side and asking the question: What is the scalable architecture, the back-end ar architecture that you need, a to design so that you have enough capacity to provide the services and to operate it so that if I'm driving my EV the car should tell me that here's a cheap charging station out here. Do it now, it's next 10, 10 miles. If you want to do green charging, or if you want to do fast charging, or do you want to do cheap charging, okay? Those are kind of the options that we may anticipate. But this open platform of a scalable architecture with open APIs and protocols has not yet been developed. Okay. And, and it affects everything again. Because if I have 10 cars charging behind a transformer, that transformer starts to heat up. It's the hottest day of the summer. Suddenly now the transformer right. has to talk to the chargers and decide right. in a different operating mode or right. things will just break down. And if you want fast charging, <laughs> right. the system should tell you not to go yeah, there. Everybody wants go somewhere fast else, <laughs> that's right. right? So that's the kind of coordination we don't know. We don't mm -hmm. have today. And you know that's the framework that we're putting together We'll be engaging with obviously the mobility service companies, the auto companies, and the electricity companies, which have not talked together. They don't have a common language. One is regulated. Electricity is regulated. Auto is unregulated. Okay, so the language has to be common. And, and the auto, no... auto industry is driven by convenience. That's right. Surely. That's right. They can't, I mean, they never imagined that fuel or electricity is a constraint for them. So we are going to have a, lots of discussions with the companies in that sector. Uh, this is global. This is not just the United States. And then we'll be putting a research project together with a group of small group of faculty and students to develop that architecture, to develop the hardware software, to implement it first on campus. Okay. So as they say in Silicon Valley, you got to eat your own dog food. Okay. So we'll be eating our own dog food. We may <laughs> We may run a pilot with Uber or something. So that's that's what we're thinking. Right. And if you're interested, um, you know, and let us know. I, I think this is a chance to go beyond, you know, math and optimization. I love those topics. It's very elegant to do things in MATLAB in the computer. But getting your hands dirty and seeing right. your stuff work, that's, right. that's what makes a real impact. Right. And this is not just science engineering. No. This is, it, you'll have pricing. That's markets, right. business models on top of that. Usability. And That's right. And everything. so that architecture has to be able to get these layers properly, correctly done. And if you have not done it well, your friends are going to be charging here on campus. Right. They will feel the effects. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just open it up for questions. We didn't have any, by the way, I think you're getting a lot of slides. We decided not to put any slides for you guys together and just have a conversation <laughs> with you. Any questions? Yeah. I don't think you mentioned it, uh, but how do you plan on incorporating security into these developments? Because um, 
I mean, if you're planning on making it more reliant on AI and data and stuff, it seems to me that it's becoming more vulnerable to cyber attack than our grid is already. Great question. You want to take a shot at it? Yeah. Um, I think uh, there's two, a two-pronged approach. Um, Arun has been building kind of an effort to bring the industry around security to grid, which is, you can imagine it's a huge challenge because everything is challenged with security and people thought the grid was safe. But we are now saying, look, no, it's not the case. The second one is internally at Stanford. We have the award-winning team. It's a team of students who go and win the hacking competition where they're supposed to hack corporate systems and then defend corporate systems. I think they place first on the hacking, second on the defending, or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so something like that. And they came and saw the lab that we put together for you guys. And they were just so excited because they said, we just see so many opportunities to hack. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like a good. carnival. It's, I can just do this all day. So through the university, I think we want to find students who have this passion for security and working with some faculty in the area and with this group from computer science to, to figure out this question. It's not a simple question. You, you ask industry, some guys will tell you it's solved until the next time things are hacked, and then, then it's not solved. So it's a, very it's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's a spy versus spy. I mean, how many of you read the mad comic book spy? spy? Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> so this is, it's going to go on, right? Yeah. And I think the, the topic of cyber is so important. And, you know, you cannot add a security protocol to a communication link and say, oh, we are all safe. It is not. That's right. We got to think of it like a system, and we got to have cyber in mind when you design the whole system. And for the EV infrastructure, charging infrastructure, I think that's an opportunity to yeah. think of it as a system for all the the attack envelope, et cetera, sort of looking at that that's right. and figuring because it out. You know, if, if you have a system that's operating at its limit, maybe I add five more cars for charging. I'm not even hacking in the traditional sense, I can bring down some portion of, of right. my local grid. And all of these kind of things have to be figured out. I think there's, there's a lot. We don't work. have machine to machine uh, two-step authentication. That's right. So we have many, you know, when you put your ATM, they ask you for your number and you put your number, that's a two-step authentication. That's we right. don't have machine to machine two-step two authentication. So you're trying to automate a system, you have to figure that out. So those are many, many challenges involved in this, but good question. I think over there, and we'll come over here and over there, yeah. Uh, so kind of regarding the electric vehicle ecosystem that we were talking about earlier, uh, I was curious because you mentioned uh, if the market beneficiary of these are going to be able to set up there might be congestion issues and lots of people can at the same time. But from, you know, I'm thinking that if we have 30 to 40 market penetration, hopefully that means that batteries are that we have a fleet of moving batteries that can do the opposite, you know, provide energy to the grid from the car. And so I'm curious about what you guys thought about the viability of that idea and how um, that kind of more shared approach to alleviating any sort of big tension. Um, Great question. Yeah, I, I think um, when we think about these problems, we do think about the possibility of two way charging and discharging. And we should point out, for 10 cars, 20 cars in the Navy parking lot, people have shown all of this is possible. But those ideas don't really scale out for tens of thousands of cars. And one lesson I learned through the grid and through my career is these kind of scaling problems, sometimes you only learn the actual questions you need to answer as you are doing the problem you will start to discover many of these issues. So in an idealized world, of course, you would love to have this two-way charging, discharging. Um, but figuring out what is going to be the bottleneck for that? Uh, is it consumer acceptance? Is it some technology issue? Is it the fact that maybe in the grid, things are much more balanced just by the charging side and so yeah. on? So. It's a big problem. I, mean, I think the grid, my intuition is that the two-way power flow is more difficult problem than the one way because the grid, the distribution network was never designed for two way. That's right. And so this is a major issue. Uh, if you are to go that way, by the way, in the United States, 
none of the EVs are bidirectional. The same Nissan Leaf that is unidirectional over here for charging is bidirectional in Japan because of regulation. It's mandated. And they just have to flip a switch, frankly. Okay, and that's because they had Fukushima and they needed power. And so they decided that's what they're going to do. And, you know, if you look at a 25 kilowatt hour battery, which a Tesla, uh, which a Nissan Leaf has, roughly 25 kilowatt hours, you can run your home the whole day. Right? The whole, the whole day can be run on a single battery charge because your home is typically about a kilowatt hour average and you got 24 hours. That's roughly a day. Yeah, I think they, there was over here, then there was over there, and then I'll come over there and then over there. Yeah. Yeah, now when it comes to all these devices and uh, time and space, and they're being interconnected just like IoT uh, for, and I go from a small size to a big size, and we're talking about a gigantic computational or computing power right here. Now, there comes a the question of where does that com computing is happening? Is it like happening at a centralized place or at some edge or edge? I think the, a lot of that is going to be, it'll be a combination of, and IoT is basically a, in a colloquial jargon for networked embedded systems. There'll be some embedding of computing um, in locally that will provide the stability of the grid, et cetera. They'll be all networked to the cloud and they'll be where the f past data will be stored, which will be analyzed and actually acted upon to send signals down to the grid and, and thereby optimize this thing. Yeah. That's the vision that we have. Yeah, I think it's an intelligence partitioning, but That's right. I think um, what we are learning is even the scaling of the cloud and on all of these issues are so important that I think you know Google is part of Absolutely. bits and watts and because right. they have to figure out, you know, can this kind of system support? And the partitioning will be based on economics. Yeah. You know, how much storage do you want over there? How much computing power do you want over there? as opposed to um, the cloud, which is really cheap right now. So that's the, yeah. So when smart charging or just charging uh, electric vehicle fleets for visibility or vehicle integration, has there been uh, research at Stanford in designing incentive structures uh, for consumers to uh, accept having their car charged at different places or time? Yeah, there, there has been some small-scale efforts of, on research. I think um, the research typically starts with some model of how users value their charging. And in my opinion, because I myself am author of some research like that, I think the weakness of that is we don't really understand that. And part of why we want to build this testbed is to kind of learn about these incentive structures and starting and, and start to design maybe something completely new. Maybe you don't charge, you don't pay each time you go. Maybe you it's pay a flat rate. TV. Maybe it's a it's flat, a flat rate, rate or something, right? That's right. Today, yeah. the electricity system is run based on dollars per kilowatt hour. Or maybe if you enable your car to be two-way, you're paid for, you're paid, that's right. for, for that. And but dollars per kilowatt hour is a pretty old way of thinking about it because if you're doing fast charging, um, you should be playing dollars per kilowatt. <laughs> right. I mean, so I think there are lots of very interesting pricing models that will come out of this. But it's a great question because the the markets and the business models and all will have to be overlaid on, on, on a platform that. of some kind. And so. and then the consumer acceptance. Right. It's, it's another issue. There was a question over there, and then over here, and then over here, and we are then running out of time. <laughs> yeah. It's always been a platform rise. So comparing to exploring the vastability of the digital system. Uh, and deploying all those smart infrastructures, uh, what do you think about rebuilding an uh, even stronger and robust grid? That, like in China, uh, several years ago, people have that we set up the construction market and then operator says, we don't even have construction here. Why to rebuild this market? So that, that says that there is a really strong grid there in some places in China. <coughs> So, so is your question about why not invest on a stronger network? Um, and I think, Arun, when you were in ARPAE, when you created ARPAE, I think this was one of the issues you Absolutely. looked up deeply. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to create a stronger grid. There's no question about it. It's At the end of the day, it comes back to the question of what is 
economics. Okay, so you can add a lot of resources to the grid and make it very strong and resilient and all that. Um, but someone has to pay for it. And the, you, can, you don't want to over-design too much. And I think that's the question is, that's the tension between how much technology uh, to make it strong, stronger, and how much cost. And I think that's the optimization that has to be played out within a regulatory framework. The Chinese regulatory framework is very different from the U.S. one. Even within U.S., it's different. You know, as um, how many people are in the law school? Um, Justice Brandeis. Do you know who Justice Brandeis is? He had a very famous saying. The United States, we have uh, a laboratory. The states, we have 50 laboratories of democracy going on. Okay, that's Justice Brandeis, right? And so in the United States, the electricity system is not quite 50, but it's like 30 or so different experiments that are going on right now. And there's different regulatory frameworks. And I think the solutions will have to be cast in economic, regulatory, as well as technology. There's no one solution. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Are there any examples of cities it's used or are constructing a kind of like Installed in a city, I think uh, plenty at different scales. Um, for example, um, the whole of Netherlands, there, there's been a very large scale effort to uh, support EVs and uh, add a lot of these resources in homes. Um, I think in the US, we have had efforts supported by the state in here in California itself. Campuses, the UC campuses, San the UC, UC San, San Diego, Diego. That's right. Is a wonderful N test bed. Navy and Army campuses right. as well. Um, so, so there is plenty of examples. And, but, and I would also add to that that Stanford campus, our energy systems folks that run the energy system on our campus are extremely open. This is not common. Yes. Are extremely open for students to to actually add things to it and use this as a test bed. In, in fact, one of the students that got the Bitten, Bitten, Bitten Watt Watts Fellowship, fellowship. Is, That's right. is doing exactly that. That's he, right. He figured out how to control better the system. And, and actually save money for campus. So your response to demand response signals and using machine learning and all that, and he's saving money for campus. And if you can do that, it's, uh, the campus will be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had a question, and I think, okay. How much time do we have? Four minutes. Okay, quick question. You touched on this a few times, but um, so physical infrastructure of the past was built for the energy system of the past, and coming into the future, um, it's sort of like this system of the past needs to handle resources of the future, but that, that it wasn't built for. And the same is true of the markets and the policy we need. So I'm wondering to what extent it, it's been lots of thinking about things like Okay, so it's not like we have to wipe the slate clean to start over. It's all kind of incremental change and how that's a challenge for adopting new resources and enabling them to um, extract some of the values they can from resources. Um, to what extent working on those problems and maybe even engaging with people like operators or utilities or like you know, commissions. We have, have. A, we have a former commissioner on our team. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, you can't so, engage more than that, I think. <laughs> that's right. But, uh, yeah. No, it's absolutely. So we deal with Cal ISO, not just Cal ISO, but others around the world, grid operators. And you're absolutely right that we need new market design to be able to manage. I mean, the markets essentially try to satisfy, solve, you know, satisfy the laws of physics through markets. Yeah. Um, it cannot do everything, but it tries to do as much as possible. Load balance and load generation balance, etc. So, I, but with new kinds of things that are coming on board, we need new markets. Uh, we don't have a futures market. See, here's the challenge. And are you in the business school? So, no. so here's the challenge. We make energy investments that last for 60 to 70 years. Okay. Uh, for example, if you decide to put a nuclear plant, that's going to last for 60 years, maybe longer. 
but it has to be paid back in the markets of today that has a maximum horizon. The capacity markets are what, three, four years horizon? Yeah, I capacity think market, it, like that's, the that's the maximum. Typically, yeah. we don't have a futures market <laughs> that takes care of long-term investments in the energy sector. And we are trying to make decisions on our energy system on a day ahead market or a capacity market, a few years market, when these investments last for 60, 70 years. We don't have any mechanism. So if you guys can innovate on markets, that'll be terrific. Yeah. And, and of course, there is faculty even in Bits and Watts who are looking at that. Looking at that. There are projects around that. So. And the last question someone had. Yeah. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. Are we looking into distributed storage systems to be able to help regulate, especially frequency and voltage and the and the intermittency of loads? We'll yeah, um, <laughs> I think th that's where, you know, Arun and I have a project uh, called PowerNet, which is about that, uh, figuring out if we have this behind the meter storage and solar and so on, and you need to regulate them to not just control voltage, but also even provide services back to the grid. Yeah. What do you do? Yes. So, so we are doing that. In the process of doing that, one of the lessons learned has been well, we are successful at doing that, but if you want to scale to something like EV where 40% of millions of cars are now in a system, we have to create something new. And it's, it's of a different scale of challenge. I mean, batteries is, is a stationary object. It is pingable and, and, and it doesn't move anywhere. It doesn't have desires of its own. So it's way easier to deal with than cars. Uh, I think one thing that, has always made me, you know, very um, think long and hard about all these problems is that sometimes what you think is an answer, then there's kind of another problem, another innovation that is in place that one creates technology problems, but then you go and try these solutions. So we went and are trying to now recruit homes, real homes in Fremont to participate in PowerNet. And the kind of questions residential users have about this technology if you put a control in the battery of course will it blow up will it will my house lights flicker will you turn off will we shut me out of my garage and what is this doing why is it good for me and it is an enormous challenge to even think about the problem holistically i think you need to be in a place like stanford where we are creating the whole energy systems program from the ground up it's totally new. It's not behold to any of these traditional ideas and traditional ways these things were seen, even at the university level, even at the level of you getting a degree and a PhD. It's very different. I don't know, Arun, don't you find that? Absolutely. Yeah, this is a... We, the beauty about Stanford, is, and it is represented in this crowd out here, is that we have people from... We have you know, one of the best business schools, law school, engineering school, sciences, humanities, education. I mean, all the schools are fantastic. And to be able to put that intellectual horsepower together to look at the problem holistically is something that I think is fairly unique out here. Otherwise, you may have a great power systems program, but you don't have the market guys. You have a fantastic program in markets, but you don't have the power of electronics, power systems people. This is something that we try to do it at home because that's what the industry or all our stakeholders, that's what they want. They are not monolithic, right? They have to have solutions that all combine and reinforce each other. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I, I think it's super exciting. And it's a place you can have, you know, a person like Arun and, and his enormous experience with this real world side. So this is another change in perspective you may want to make as well. I think impact in energy through science and engineering, you know, having that practical impact is possible. We are trying to build up the means to help you do that. And this is a place we encourage you to do that. It's not, it's not just about writing papers, which we know you guys are brilliant. I, I think most of our ideas and bits and watts came from students. Is that That's fair right. to That's say? That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, we know you guys are able to do that. But we are challenging you to now take it up another notch 
because the time is not 15, 20, 30 years from now. When they say 2045, the solution has to be ready in the next five to 10 years because you need to test this thing and scale it up and so on and, and build you know, the, the whole system out. So it's not something you can wait and, and somebody else is going to do and so on. By the way, the governor from Washington, state of Washington, Jay Inslee, he was there. And when he heard the governor of California, we had a dinner all together. The governor of California said by 2045, he, he piped up and said, Washington will do it at 2044. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a race going on between the state of Washington and the state of California, which is a wonderful thing to have. That's right. <laughs> Maybe we can automate the whole campus energy system and all the EV charging even in the next 10 years or five years. On that note, I think we've run out of time. Yes. It was a terrific discussion. And, you know, and join us in what we do.